My name is Lysia Heath. I'm CEO of Women for Election Australia, and this is our inaugural In Conversation series, a weekly series that we're we are kicking off to give you access to different women who are either currently elected, uh, trying to get elected, or um, have all sorts of uh, tips and traps to give our audience in terms of why we want more women in our legislative chambers and, and how they can have success doing it. So, uh, Christy, formally, welcome to today's session. Looks like you're still on mute. No, you're not now. But um, thank you for giving us your time in what is a whirlwind federal campaign. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I feel like I've just been talking to people or I've had a, um, a phone glued to the side of my head for the last three weeks. So um, my apologies, you'll have to see my uh, face and my voice again. It's um, a little bit strange driving along and seeing my face plastered on, you know, roadsides and things, but um, well, I'll have get to get used to, it. to that for now. <laughs> um, well, look, I've got a, a few questions that I want to ask you. Uh, some quick housekeeping. Everyone's on mute currently. I'll ask a, a few uh, questions of Christy. If you have questions you want to ask, please enter them into the chat box and I will be monitoring that and we can ask Christy those questions towards the end. Um, but you'll be on mute in the interim and if you want to use speak of you, we find that's the, the best view for this session. So. So, Christy, you um, tell us. Let, let's start at the beginning. Tell us how how young you were, or how old you were, uh, when you decided that you were going to run for the first time, which was at a local government election, and what it was that motivated you to run. Um, so, I was uh, twenty nine. Um, I was on maternity leave actually. I had a two year old and a three month old and I thought, what else can I fill my days with? Um, so I decided I would run for local council and, and what prompted me to do that was there was a decision about a, a playground or a sports ground and I can't honestly remember what it was, um, but I was mortified that they'd come to this decision uh, nine councillors, uh, eight of whom were male, one was female, all over the age of 55. And I just thought, look, that's not really representative of the community as a whole. Um, and instead of throwing rocks from the outside, I thought, you know what, let's just um, put our hand up and, and try to change things from the inside. Yeah. So that's what I did. Well, and did you but get elected? Yeah, on your first time, yeah. Yeah, got elected on the first time. And um, I think one of the big things, are, and I've, it's interesting now in a federal election campaign, the, the m machinery that goes into this. At a local level, I literally spent $500 on my campaign. And at the time I was mortified because I was on maternity leave. I've spent $500, um, but uh, it, it worked. And I think it worked because I was so different to so many other people seeking election, that I was a young female, that I did have um, smaller children. And um, some of you are probably um, have kids of your own. And it really does give you a different uh, mindset sometimes about why you think about things and how you think about them. Mm -hmm. um, and even I find younger women with, with out kids um, they know a whole heap of families so the the way you think and your decision making process is generally a little bit different anyway so um, I was so different that people elected me um, so I'm the youngest person to ever be elected in the Bega Valley um, I was re-elected in 2016 with an increased um, vote um, and was elected mayor in 2016 and it was the same thing in 2016 when the the nine councillors uh, were determined it became pretty clear to me that it was either going to be um, myself or a, an older gentleman who was in his 70s and had a very different view on the world to me and again I asked myself that question am I prepared to sit here um, and go a certain direction uh, and complain about it or am I prepared to do something about it so I thought and by that time, I'd had a third kid just to add, you know, some more chaos in. Um, so he was um, 
Oh, God, 18 months old when I got elected uh, mayor in 2016 um, at 33 and I was the youngest mayor ever elected in the Bega Valley and only the second female um, ever elected to the position as well. Well, those are some fabulous firsts and I remember meeting you at our 2018 uh, conference, our Inspire conference we held in Sydney and you were there and Joe Dodds was there as well and I know it had been out the back of the the Tathra fires. Um, something we talk about at our Inspire conferences so frequently is how we as women can link the purpose we feel, purpose to parliament. Don't, don't think that you have to do it outside of that arena. You can link that purpose within that arena. So it would be great if you could give us some insight into, so, you, so your time on council, council, then you're the mayor. Can you give us some tangible examples of how, you know, you improved the status quo for your community? So um, in the 2012 election, there ended up being four females elected and five males so we were um, nearly on par which was which is fantastic for our local community um, I very much said about my role as making sure that I was um, representing that demographic that I set out to represent in the first place but also making the communication around um, council um, its decision making um, process uh, a lot more transparent so um, I have a, you know, a whole network of, of friends through, you know, PNCs and, and, you know, sporting groups and all that stuff who understood that there was a local council and understood what the council did, but didn't actually understand what the elected body did. Um, so I set about trying to uh, inform people a little bit more about what the decisions that council actually had to make you know we're not state or federal governments we we don't have tons of money to throw at projects um, you know the, the projects that you're doing are, are really the ones that make a real difference to communities you know having a good public toilet um, you know is as a young mum really key and making sure it's really close to the things that your kids are going to be at really key um, so you know just trying to demystify some of the things that local council did was was what I was trying to do in that first term of council in the second term of council after I was elected as mayor and there were six females elected um, three males and at that time we had employed um, council's first ever female general manager as well um, was uh, try to demystify it at a much bigger scale. Um, so after every council meeting, I would get on and do a Facebook video, um, basically talking about some of the decisions council made that day and, and um, talking about council's role as a strategic decision maker, not as an organisational uh, player. So I think a lot of the time people get the two mixed up as you know we set uh, policy uh, for council and long-term strategic plans uh, we don't get involved in the general day-to-day -day business of council but as elected representatives we do um, take on those questions from community and try to get them answers and if the settings aren't right and what you see in your community, the settings aren't right for them, then you try to change that by uh, policy and strategy change. So just trying to demystify that a little bit more. The other thing that I've had a big hand in since I've been the mayor is um, the staffing profile of the organisation between 2012 and 2016 um, was getting quite uh, towards retirement age and we were literally having planning se sessions around the, the knowledge cliff we're about to face, you know, with all of these retirements that would happen, you know, really in uh, close proximity to each other, how council would then fare. Um, and what I've found since I've taken over as mayor is that we've started to attract a lot of younger families into the area. Um, all of our directors are now uh, much younger, with, have come with, with families. We actually have a full complement of engineers in the Bega Valley and if you're from local council world, you'll know finding engineers is really hard. Um, I'm part of the Canberra Region Joint Organisation which takes in the 
10 local council areas around the ACT. No other council in our, um, in our region has a full complement of engineers. So um, trying to change how people view your place um, was, was one of my big challenges. So it was no longer somewhere that you just came to retire. It was somewhere where you came to build a career as well. Okay. Well, fabulous. What, so you, you've, you've, had, you've got three children. I see one of the questions is about how you, you combine being a counsellor with, with full-time work, um, which is a question we get at a, a lot of our sessions. Uh, so feel free to answer that now because I'm sure it's a, a juggle. But Yeah, de look, definitely a drug juggle. So for me as a counsellor, when I was elected in that first term of council, I was on maternity leave for a, a, a portion of that. Uh, I was working part time and also doing the books for my husband's plumbing business because again, you know, I didn't have enough on my plate, wanted to take on some more. Um, and then I had a, another child, so I went on maternity leave again. Um, but I remained working part time for, for most of that first term of council. Um, I was still working part time um, as a lawyer uh, for the first nine months of my mayoral term. Um, but it came clear very quickly to me that even though you are not remunerated as a full-time position, it is a full-time position. Um, and as some of you might be aware, we've experienced uh, three bushfires in two years. Um, we're of, uh, in significant drought in the Bega Valley and uh, obviously then COVID-19. So uh, my time was definitely more than allocated uh, to being a mayor and to making sure that I was advocating the best for my community. So in the end, I wasn't able to, to uh, remain in my uh, paid position as a lawyer any longer. Okay. Well, we certainly, I mean, you know, we, <laughs> no one was under a rock and we saw how devastating those bushfires were. And, uh, you know, I'm in Sydney and was in, uh, 13 weeks of smoke, which, which is just nothing compared with what you and your community were going through. Uh, and then to launch into COVID, a, a global pandemic as well. Um, you've then decided to run in a federal campaign. So, you know, if that, that's a holy trilogy, if ever I've heard one. That's right, I wasn't busy enough, so just lob that one in too. So, so, so can you tell our, our attendees like the process of decision making. So you, you've been a councillor, now you're a mayor. Um, and, you know, the, the whole idea of women for election is to make what is currently a very opaque process more transparent, i.e. Yeah. How, how, you, how you would run. So walk us through the process of going into a federal um, ballot, for want of a better word. So did the ALP approach you? Did you approach them? Was it a slow and steady kind of conversation? Look, I think my, um, uh, you know, work on council over the last seven and a half years, I've been able to, to network with a lot of people right across the local government sector, obviously in the, the first instance. Um, and then as the, the mayor, uh, deputy chair of the JO, I was on the executive of the Country Mayors Association, you know, you start to form little networks with people and you're, you're talking to state and federal politicians about the needs for your community or the needs for your sector. Um, so that's what I set about doing, um, not for my own benefit, for the benefit of um, the community I was representing. Um, my time in council as a mayor, I was apolitical. Um, during an election campaign, I would speak to candidates um, from all sides of, of politics. Um, if they asked us to, to speak to me as the mayor, I would do so, um, but I wouldn't be actively involved in anyone's campaign. In fact, I didn't even get a photo with anyone during any state or federal election campaign because that wasn't my role. My role was to try to, to strangle these people for money for my community. Um, so that's what I did there. But obviously after the last couple of bushfires we've had down um, in the Bega Valley, um, my network has grown a, a lot. And I was getting quite frustrated with um, the lack of quick decision making um, and the unwillingness to listen to local communities who are actually impacted, who are actually telling um, politicians, these are the things we actually need and this is when we need them to try to to try to get through this. Um, 
And I hadn't expressed that to, to a, a large audience because it's not my role to, as the mayor, not my role to go and can people over things. It's my role to try to work with whomever to get the outcome. Um, but I was approached by um, Anthony Albanese when Mike Kelly um, was going to resign and asked whether I would consider running for the AAP, a ALP in Eden Monero. I'd previously been a, a young ACT Labor member um, back when I was at university, but hadn't renewed my membership because, um, you know, as a young person in their 20s, your cash is very limited. Um, so it went to the things that I needed it to go to at the time. So um, I hadn't, um, you know, really thought about it until the, this opportunity came up. And then I thought, well, again, if you want to make a change, then there's no better way to do it than try to get on the inside and actually change it from the inside rather than throwing stones from the outside. Yes. Well, you know, congratulations. Again, that's linking that purpose to, to Parliament. And, you know, I think it's something we see over and over at our, our events. We, um, we have so many women attend our events who are doing some form of leadership in their community already. Uh, whatever that happens to be, it could be uh, head of the Eastern Suburbs uh, Auskick <laughs> group. I, I make be. that point all the time that leadership isn't about a title and I think sometimes people get you know I've got to have this job or I've got to have this position because otherwise I'm not in leadership and for me that's just not true leadership isn't about a title um, leadership is how you live your everyday life um, and when you're confident in the things that you're doing people naturally follow you anyway so you know the titles and the jobs will come afterwards but if you know, you're confident in yourself um, and you know what you're doing is is the right thing for you and it's the right thing for your community. Hopefully people see that and they'll follow you. Yeah, fabulously said. Uh, more women leaders in our community, leaders converting that into uh, political careers, I think would just help our country no end. Uh, you are doing all sorts of media at the moment and I saw you on... Um, Sky News, was it early last week with uh, Graham Richardson and, and Alan Jones, uh, the dynamic duo. Uh, I saw Richo ask you at one particular moment saying, um, it's, so, it's so easy to be a woman candidate now. Uh, you really kind of get a free kick being a woman in a campaign these days. Uh, there aren't too many, uh, I have to say, councils where that there aren't women these days, though, are there? I mean, your demographic seems to me to be pretty well covered. In fact, as I look around the Labor Party these days, um, it's much easier to be a candidate if you're a woman, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're making up for lost time. Well, in 2012, when I ran for council, there was eight men and one woman on council, uh, all over the age of uh, 55. And and so when I talk about demographics, it's not just gender. Uh, we're talking about age demographics. Um, you know, it was it was great to be on council having young kids because it brings with it a different dynamic. Um, you you see things a little bit differently, and when you're you're picturing what how the the, the place is going to change, you're picturing how your kids will grow up in it. And it's the same with Eden Monero. Like. They're, our regional communities are suffering at the moment. We've talked about drought, bushfires, and now COVID-19. We've got regional economies right across the Eden Monero that are suffering. And the thing that I hear frequently is that, you know, people would love to move back to the regional community they grew up in, but they can't get good full-time local jobs. Eden Monero is renowned for very seasonal, very casualised jobs. Um, and we need to make sure that when we're planning futures in regional economies, we're planning for our kids and our grandkids, uh, places where they can come back, raise a family and know that they're going to uh, meaningfully contribute to the economy. Uh, I think you blocked and bridged it beautifully, but uh, what do you think about that question and uh, how has your experience as a woman been out on the campaign trail so far? Um, you know that meme where the woman's sipping her coffee and then she splutters it everywhere? That's, that was my internal reaction um, to that question. But, um, yeah, look, uh, it's, it's, 
it's definitely not easy. Um, and I go back to when I first ran for council in 2012. Um, I had a two and a half year old and a three month old. I was breastfeeding in the chamber. Um, and my first council meeting, I moved a motion that we changed the council meeting day because I didn't have childcare on the, the day that it was meant to be on a, it was meant to be on a Tuesday and I asked for it to be changed to a Wednesday. And the collective gasp of people in the room, like I had asked them to, you know, move the council offices to Siberia um, because for somehow changing the day that we met would change the whole, you know, dynamic of council. Um, and, you know, interestingly, I had the biggest opposition from another woman and I've, you know, now she's one of my biggest supporters, but at the time she was like, you, you're trying to change us. And I'm, no, I'm not trying to change you. I'm trying to, to make it more friendly for people. Um, I've tried over a number of years to, to get them to meet at a later time. So at the moment they meet mid, you know, uh, mid afternoon on a Wednesday, which precludes automatically a whole heap of working men and women um, from taking part in local government. And, you know, I think that um, changes the dynamic if you can actually make it more family friendly um, and allow people to actually have a, a paying job uh, as well as their counsellor role. But look, I th the interesting part is when I first became a lawyer and um, I was working uh, in Canberra, Queanbeyan and Yass before I moved back down the coast uh, and I frequently got the question of when is the lawyer coming in? Somehow, because I was a female, I was the secretary um, and I was there to take somebody's notes, um, which always I dutifully shut down as, well, I can go and get a different lawyer if you like, but you're meeting with me today. Oh, I didn't realise. So sorry. Um, and then the other one I get a lot is not about me being a female. It's about my age. It's always like, oh, you're too young to do that or you're too young to know or you don't have any life experience. Um, you know, and we can all talk about our life's experience, yeah. but your life experience isn't measured in years. It's measured in the things that you've you've had to do or put up with or change or whatever in your lifetime. So um, they're the, the, the type of things I've got. Interestingly, on this campaign trail, I haven't had anything of that nature. Yeah. Um, so Richo was the first one that's actually mentioned anything about uh, it being easy or harder for me as a, as a female. Um, I think I spoke to you at uh, at a conference, Leisha, and um, basically made the point to you that um, our political institutions are set up um, for men um, because they are, you know, in a place where everyone has to travel to. There's no recognition that you have other responsibilities for family um, and it always is going to be a lot harder because we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as females to be and do everything you know that mum guilt plays a a big role in a lot of the decisions we make um but before taking on this role i was actually um gonna say no i was gonna say look kids are too young i don't think i can give it my best shot um and my husband was the one that said no we're doing this um and it was the same when uh, i was talking about being the mayor he said no we're doing this so it's definitely a, a team effort for us and it has to be because we're both parents um we both had the kids uh, and we'll both raise the kids so it's not just about me it's about him and the kids as well so without that support it would make it a lot harder yes oh look i can i totally concur and there's a few things to pick up in that but you know life experience gee something tells me you've got a bit of life experience under your belt in the last six months, let alone the last couple of years. So don't worry about that. Um, look, part of the, like the conference that, that you attended and the events we run um, are about providing tangible skills to help women run in a campaign, whether that be public speaking, whether it be social media, whether it be understanding preferences or um, you know, just all those things that are kept so opaque. How would I run with a party? How would I run as an independent? How would how does pre-selection work? Um, so tell us about the skills that you're using currently out on the campaign trail. And I'm, I'm interested in both sides, the skills that you're using the most of and equally the skills that you thought you'd need that you're, that you're not actually needing. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> I guess um, the way I've always approached um, both being in council and in this election campaign is that I'm, I'm not there to preach to people. I'm not trying to convert them. I'm trying to have a conversation with them and find out what it is that m would make, you know, their town or, or their sports club or, you know, their job easier or better. Um, what, what it would be that would um, help their community to grow. Um, so I don't go in with this mantra, I've got to ram something down someone's throat. And I think far too often we see people trying to to ram sand bites down people's throats, like that's the way to win them over. Um, so I just try to go into everything as having a conversation, even with the people that aren't going to like me or aren't going to vote for me. Because um, at the end of the day, you're there to represent everyone, the people that did vote for you and the people that didn't. So um, I just try to approach everything as a, a conversation. Let's have a chat. Um, hopefully you'll like the way I'm going to go about things. Um, because I don't plan on changing who I am or what I'm about. So they either vote for me because of that or they don't. That's their call. Um, the things that I thought I would need that I don't need, um, God, I don't, I don't know. Jeez, I tell you what, the, um, as a female, this is hard. Sorry for the men in this chat too. <laughs> Making sure that uh, your outfit is appropriate. So annoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, you can wear the same shirt, pants, jacket and tie for days in a row as, as a bloke. And if I wore the same shirt two days in a row, God, it would be all over the place. When I actually, going back to when I was the mayor, I opened an intersection of all things, you know. Let's cut as many ribbons as we can on an intersection. And I was wearing what I thought was a lovely sequined gold, you know, knit. And the guy next to me was in high, high vis and a hard hat. And the first comment on social media was, she could have dressed up for the occasion, couldn't she? Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> what do you want me to wear to the opening of an intersection? <laughs> yeah, I think it's something we talk about that it, you are judged through a different lens. So you can either get frustrated and say, well, I refuse to be, or you can understand what that different lens is. And you, and you don't have to not be yourself. Yeah. There are ways that you can still be yourself, but um, the lens is real, even even if it's hopefully just for the for the short term. Um, I'm going to so get your questions going in the chat. I'm going to I'm going to pose my last question before I throw to their questions, which is um, for, for everyone that's attending now, some people are thinking that actively they are right in the process right now of will I run? Victorian local government elections are later this year. Queensland state elections are later this year. New South Wales local government elections have been pushed back to, to next year. Um, but that could provide opportunities for, for people that, that weren't going to be there, there um, otherwise. What would you say to them about why they should step forward? Look, if you're thinking about it, you obviously have something in your mind that you want to achieve or you want to change. Um, because most people don't just do it just for the sake of it because it's a lot to, lot to take on if you're not really invested in the thing that you want to do or the thing that you're passionate about. Just step forward. It's daunting, it, even <laughs> when I was sitting outside our, um, uh, returns office in the car at the two kids in the back and I had the form and I'd pulled up and I thought am I going to do this or not and I gave myself a thousand reasons why I shouldn't do it you know kids are young I don't have time you know it's going to detract from the other things you know blah 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 blah, blah. Um, but the one thing that I did want to do it for is because I couldn't any longer sit on the sidelines I couldn't any longer complain about it. And if I wasn't prepared to step forward, then what makes me different to the next person not stepping forward? And if all of us don't step forward, um, you know, the field becomes very narrow. So it's daunting. Um, but if you're passionate about something or you have, um, you know, that desire or need to make sure that your voice is amplified through that um, avenue, then you have to do it because otherwise you will only kick yourself 
later mm -hmm. and you'll only find yourself complaining about the decisions that or the things you would have done differently um, have a go like I I spoke to um, uh, another lawyer who had ran for local council uh, years earlier and he said to me if uh, if uh, I was your age again, I would have put my hand up a lot earlier because, you know, the, the benefit we have um, is time. So we need to make sure our voice is heard early so that it changes the, uh, the discourse happening um, for the long term. So, yes, it's daunting. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's going to be challenging. Yes, it's going to be frustrating. But yes, it's also going to be completely rewarding. Um, and you will also learn a lot from the process. So just step forward. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, I see there's a couple of questions here. So, so Philippa on the call. So I'm an endorsed first time candidate for the New South Wales local government elections. Um, any advice on raising, maintaining a profile for an extremely long campaign? Yeah, and the New South Wales local government elections are now going to be a very long campaign. Um, look, you need, you need to make sure that you're involved in a whole range of local um, events and communities um, and not... Um, pretentiously or fakely, you know, the things that you're actually passionate about and involved in. Um, the one thing that I that frustrates me is coming up to election where you see somebody all of a sudden, you know, become really involved in this one particular thing and you're like, mate, where were you 12 months ago when we, <laughs> when we were deciding all of this or when we put this out or whatever it is. So get involved in your PNCs, get involved in your basketball club, get involved in your, your history society, whatever it is that you're passionate about, make sure you're involved in that um, at a local level. Um, social media plays a massive role in, um, in campaigning now and you're all probably a member of a range of different community groups on Facebook, whether they relate to, you know, a notice board for your local community um, or a, a page that is specifically to, I want to change Bega Park or whatever it is, um, you know, make sure that people get to know you and, and what you're passionate about via those um, social groups as well um, on Facebook. They, they do play a, a massive role, but look, it is going to be a really long election campaign and I would not peak too early. Okay, I think that's a great advice and getting involved in local community campaigns is something we say in our events all the time. So maybe it's for a, a local community campaign for a playground in a park or for schools or it's the PNC or whatever it happens to be. You get a network out the back of that. Um, you can get a profile, you start, you get in touch with your local paper, those that still exist and say, um, can I write an article for you on this topic? I'm really passionate about it. And a profile starts linking, you know, out the, out the back of that. And then you yeah. can promote that on your own Facebook page. But there is, an, there is another equal part of that, which is don't get trapped in it. Go and be the PNC president for two years. Do not stay there for longer thinking that they can't deal without you or that no one's going to step in there because that is um, it's very noble work. We all do it. Um, it's noble, but it keeps you too busy. Yeah, too busy to do the other things. So, so do it, but exit. Do it, yep. exit. <laughs> um, so sorry, I have. I'm going back to the questions now. Um, uh, let me have a look. So, if you could change one thing about the structure and operation of federal parliaments to make it more accessible to women, what would it be? Um, and not just accessible for women, but also accessible for men. I think we can see right now that. So many people are working from home and it works fine. You know, we're doing this Zoom chat now and we're from all over the place. Um, our council meetings have gone to Zoom meetings at the moment and we obviously have some councillors that are um, of an age group that they, they shouldn't be more exposed um, uh, to the public than necessary. Um, we also obviously have some councils with health issues as well. Um, but there should be no reason that someone can't participate in public life from wherever they are 
and in that vein, there should be no reason that people can't do a whole range of work um, in a range of different areas. Um, we've seen that work over the last few weeks and months now. Um, you know, you could be anywhere working to, you know, one of the, the top companies um, in Australia and you could and should be able to be anywhere uh, and still involved in the operation of, of Parliament. There could be, a, for example, a, a set number of days you have to be physically available, uh, but then a range of days where you're in your electorate office and you're still able to contribute to the, to the parliamentary debate. Um, and I think those things need to be be looked at into the future. Um, it's an interesting point you made there about accessibility, and the, and that was in a federal sense. But yes, council meetings all going online now massively increases the accessibility for you know in terms of meetings doing that way. So um, you know the gift of COVID could be the gift of. Um, we have been able to do things this entire time, but now we are, we are doing them this way. And the barriers to entry drop as a consequence. It hasn't dropped in all the tiers of government, but um, you know, I think I think that's a positive thing for women for women's involvement. Uh, now, another question in terms of funding for campaigns. So um, people can run with major parties, minor parties, independents. Um, and there's a whole ream of different reasons for why you do one, not the other, uh, uh, you know, not just about values, um, but including values, obviously. From a funding component, if you run for the Labor Party, do they pay for everything? Do they pay for some things? You pay for some things? Well, give us a bit of insight into how that works. Yeah, look, if you're a pre-selected candidate um, in a general election, you're responsible for a whole range of fundraising and funding your own campaign. It's a little bit different in a by-election because, um, you know, you're literally, you know, at the moment, I'm the only game in town, which is sometimes very confronting and other times fantastic. Um, but yeah, look, you're still responsible for a whole range of your own fundraising, um, making sure that you're connecting um, with people and getting them to contribute to the campaign. And it's not always just about dollars, um, getting a whole range of volunteers involved um, to do phone banking or to hand out your how to vote cards, um, you know, to go and talk to their local um, communities or committees um, about the reasons you might vote a particular way. Um, so trying to get enough manpower to do a whole range of thing, things as well as get enough dollars to do it. Um, Eda Monero is over 40,000 square kilometres. Um, so for me, trying to get uh, enough people on the ground to, for example, to man a booth, if we're allowed to do that, and we're still unsure about how the election's going to be um, rolled out, um, and to do the phone banging because you're not doing, um, you know, we're not doing a big events to raise funds because we can't do those at the moment. We're not doing town hall meetings to go through issues because you can't do that at the moment. You know, people usually like to hold um, meet the candidates nights. They're not happening because you can't have people in a room together. So this campaign is probably going to be different to any other that we'll see Um in a normal election sense, um, but hopefully it might, again, change the way that we do things into the future anyway. Well, I think, I think you're right. And I see in the chat, um, Ruth McGowan on, on our session and, you know, something that Ruth, Ruth is the Women for Election training partner and we're about to launch a whole bunch of online um, training webinars to adapt to, to the, the current climate. Uh, and, you know, part of that focus is how do you campaign in COVID times? Yeah. If you can't door knock, if there's no meet the candidate events, um, what are the other ways that you get cut through? So um, you are an absolute test case, you I and know. your fellow candidates, Christy, in, in that sense. <laughs> but um, so we all watch with great interest. <laughs> um, I'm actually quite hopeful that... Um, Election days might change a bit. It's it's actually my pet hate when someone shoves how to vote cards down your <laughs> down your throat. Um, and now I'm going to be that person. <laughs> Here, take this, take this. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm actually hopeful that it might change the way we do election days in general because um, I think a lot of people get frustrated at the 
the um, you know the grabbing and the the, the carry on that sometimes take place, and it doesn't happen at all polling um, booths. Um, you know, some are, are quite cordial and and low key, but others are are quite intense, and I think it puts some people off running for election because that's what they see as the you know the final hurdle is to to hand out as many of these things as possible um and it puts voters off so um i'm kind of a bit hopeful that those things might change into the future yeah oh one of my pet favorites is love all the primary schools wrapped in massive amounts of plastic saying we're pro climate change yeah, right. <laughs> Um, I love I love that one. Yeah. Uh, so look, I think um, I see one more question there from Tim. How will your experience as a mayor help you to be a good federal representative? Thank you for it that. Will be our last question. Thank you for that question, Tim. Um, and I have a very particular view on this. Um, because as the mayor, there is no escaping your constituents. As a local representative, there's no escaping them. It once took me three hours to do a shop at Woolworths. Um, I then changed to doing an online shop because it was just taking too long. Um, but as the as the mayor, um, people do not care what level of government their issue is about. They just know that you're the local person and they're going to hammer you about it regardless of what it is. Um, and I was always one of those people, um, I love Jacinda Ardern's um, uh, comments around just because I'm listening, that does not make me weak. You know, I can disagree with you, but I'm still going to hear you out. Um, so I listen to a lot of that um, politely and then say, actually, that's a state government issue, but we can make representations on your behalf or I say, It'd be great if we could do that project, but we don't have any funding for it. Perhaps you could help us um, campaign the, the uh, state or federal government politicians for that funding. Um, but I think being the mayor keeps you very connected to your community. Like there is no escaping what people are thinking because they will just out with it and tell you. Um, and so part of the reason that I agreed to run was because I think we need at a federal level especially to do a lot more listening um, to local communities when we're coming out with big policies that af affect a lot of people. After the Tathra fires, we asked the federal government for funding um, because our council itself had been absolutely smashed. We had a whole heap of employees impacted. We had a whole heap of infrastructure impacted, some of which didn't attract any funding whatsoever. And we knew that we would have to change the way we did business to um, prioritise those people that had been directly impacted, which would have a detrimental effect on council's bottom line. We received nothing. So no additional funding from the federal government, despite us putting together, you know, uh, case after case, telling them how it was going to impact us. You know, despite the visits uh, from the Prime Minister and, and several of his ministers, nothing changed. In the last fires that we had, there was an immediate, here's some money to local government because we know that they're going to be impacted. So hopefully that's because of the experience we've, we've showed them, that we were going to be really badly impacted. Um, but my biggest bugbear was that when we were talking about the impact on small business, the impact on industries, the impact on the whole community, um, we weren't being listened to. And, you know, I would set up five case studies and say, you know, this is the impact on the tourist exclusion zone on small businesses where there wasn't actually flame impact. So they were just impacted by the wider disaster. And I was told time and time again, we're not in the business of assisting small businesses. That's, that's not our remit. Um, and then we go on and all of a sudden it is their remit to support small businesses. So I, I my frustration at trying to relay what I was seeing and hearing from my community and nothing being actioned when I was asking for it led to me going, right, again, I'm just going to try to change it from the inside. So I think being the mayor gives you a, or being a councillor or being super involved in your um, local area gives you a really clear sense of purpose um, and hopefully remains you being connected to your community. Yeah. 
fabulous. We're back. We're back to purpose again, and we're going to link it to Parliament. I <laughs> just, you know, fingers get, no. Yeah. Well, you know, for all of our attendees, we're here to help you run and to help you be successful running. You know, we are a non-partisan group, um, but you have so many of the skills you need already. Uh, what you just need is the additional bits of information that uh, complete the puzzle. So, Christy, you know, kudos to you for, for all the work that you've done so far for your community, but, um, but for putting yourself um, forward at, at the federal level. Uh, we want more women in our legislative chambers for many reasons, but, but part of the reason you nailed just then, which is women tend to be more visible out in their electorates. They tend to listen to their constituents more. They tend to take more constituent meetings and that results in feeding up constitu constituent needs at a policy level. So, um, you know, I think you've got uh, some proof statements there that you've done that already. So um, everyone can do a uh, clap on the screen to say thank you for Christy for coming along. We really appreciate it and, it, and a busy time. Um, and please, you know, keep keep track of all the events that we're running in the in the coming weeks. Both our in conversation series, which are weekly on Wednesday, we have Dai Lee next, um, the fabulous powerhouse Dai Lee next Wednesday. Uh, we will have Fiona Cotvoy, who is the Liberal candidate in the Eden Monaro by election, the following week. Um, and you will also shortly see us launch our online training series that we would want you to be a part of. Um, in the interim, uh, go on our website, see the resources there, grab yourself the Get Elected campaign candidate handbook written by Ruth McGowan, which is a fabulous resource, and follow our campaign, our big campaign, which is 2000 by 2022. We want to help 2,000 women run uh, over the next two years, running into the federal election. 2,000 women that weren't going to run otherwise. So um, if, you have, if, if you're able to, we'd love you to donate to that campaign via our website. And Christy, thank you again and all the best for the coming weeks leading into election day. Uh, and if people want experience of what it's like in a federal election campaign, get yourself down to Eden Monero um, and volunteer on one of the campaigns. It is a fantastic insight as to how things run and could give you, could upskill you in a very quick pace as well. So thanks again, Christy. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for having me. All the best. I hope I have uh, inspired some of you to put your hand up, step forward and, and have a crack. Fabulous. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week.